Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Uber Tech Conference. Everybody have already heard a lot of awesome presentations today um, around various Uber technologies, like life of a trip, fighting fraud. If anyone is ever interested to know how Uber's physical infrastructure is built to support that, you can find an answer in my presentation. I'm going to walk with you to explore the IPv6 deployment at Uber and also use the chance to introduce to you Uber's physical infrastructure and network architecture. Um, so first, a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Jing He. I'm a network engineer working at Uber. I joined Uber in 2015. And um, prior to work, uh, Uber, I worked at Twitter, Cisco, and Qualcomm. All my career has been in networking field, and I'm going to share my networking knowledge with every one of you today and to decode uh, Uber network. So we're going to talk about, about Uber numbers and show you what scale Uber is operating at and what are the challenges and motivations we're facing from our operation work. And then we'll take an overview on the internet uh, IPv4 status and what's the IPv6 deployment status overall. And then we'll deep dive into Uber's IPv6 deployment. We'll be analyzing Uber's uh, network architecture and what's the software and vendor support for that. And then last, we'll talk about the challenges, lessons learned, and a call for action, how everyone here can help us uh, during this process. Okay, let's first go through some Uber numbers. What scale is Uber operating at? We reached over 1 billion trips in December 2015. And soon after that, less than half a year, we reached over 2 billion trips in June 2016. We're now operating uh, in over 70 countries and more than 400 cities. So how is Uber's network supporting that? We have multiple data centers nowadays, and we also have a couple of network uh, POPs, uh, which is the network point of presence. And we also have a number of uh, cloud presences. We're operating over tens of thousands of servers. And from an IP resource perspective, we used over 8 million IPv4 addresses. If you want to ask how we reach here, here is a, a short history of Uber's physical infrastructure. Prior to 2014, um, Uber was managed in a hosting facility called Peak. And while Uber grows, the capacity need cannot be met by this uh, hosting facility. And also, most importantly, while we were operating at this hosting facility, we had a couple of outages. In order to provide uh, best and most reliable services for Uber customers. In uh, October 2014, we started to build Uber's first data center. And in 2015, we continued to expand and we built multiple data centers in North America. And we also expanded out of business into China, built multiple data, cent data centers there as well. In 2016, our footprint expands into cloud presences and we build a number of network pops. And we also started to manage infrastructures for autonomous driving vehicles like ATC and auto uh, organizations. And from 2017 on, Uber is going to expand everywhere. So um, what are some of the um, challenges and motivations we've seen from an IP resource perspective during this growth? Um, first, our historically IP allocation of IPv4 resources have been pretty generously. Um, each of our server rack, for example, uh, have been allocated 256 addresses. Although, in fact, uh, we um, no, have no more than 48 servers in a server rack. The motivation behind that was definitely we want to provide a scalable uh, solution for that for future growth. Another challenge that we face is overlapping IP addresses while we started to merge with different organizations. By now, we have used more than half of our 10 slash 8 IPv4 IP spaces. And it is estimated that by the end of 2017, we may run out of IPv4 spaces given the current growth speed that Uber has. On the other hand, um, externally taking a look, we have more and more cell carriers starting to support a native, a native IPv6 traffic. So those are the internal motivators and challenges that Uber faces in calling for a solution. What are some of the external uh, status? Let's take an overview on internet for v4 status and what's the IPv6 deployment status. So um, before I go deep dive into that, might please get a show of hands who's familiar with IPv4 and IPv6. Oh, awesome, we have almost half of the member here. <laughs> let's pray the other half. Um, let's take a benefit of um, 
uh, review some of the IPv4 and IPv6 differences. So uh, basically, IPv4 address is 32-bit, and its text representative format is uh, separating uh, by period, while IPv6 address have 128 bits separating uh, by columns in its text representative format. Another thing is their headers are different. IPv6 removed a couple of unused fields um, in its header that IPv4 has in, in its header and introduced some new fields like flow labels. Another thing to call out is that um, due to the resource restriction of IPv4 resources, sometimes you will be using a NAT functionality or even a hardware dedicated for network address translation between your internal network and external network. And obviously, due to that, you have 128 bits of IPv6, more than enough addresses that you can imagine. You no longer, and typically we don't use the NAT function in IPv6 deployment. Some other benefits of IPv6 includes that uh, with the help of traffic class and flow label fields, you will able to do comprehensive qu quality of service quads. And also there is built-in packet encryption and authentication and IPv6 extension headers. So how does IPv4 look globally? Do we really run out of IPv4 addresses? It is official now that with the Boomi mobiles, uh, there are more mobile devices that, than the number of people on the earth, more than six billion. And with the 32 bit of IPv4 addresses, you have 4.3 billion addresses, theoretically, that you can use. Um, and with the booming internet of things, this definitely don't seem enough. And, and more importantly, we actually started to experience IPv4 exhaustions. There are multiple regional internet registries around the globe, and since 2011, these regional internet re, uh, registries, which are the uh, registrations help to allocate IP resources, um, a number of them like APNIC, um, uh, RIPE, uh, LACNIC, which are the regional uh, internet registries in Asia Pacific, Europe, Latin America, they started to announce that their I, uh, free IPv4 resources has run out. And most recently, in September 2015, ARIN, which is the American Registry for Internet Numbers, they have announced that their last free IPv4 pool has reached their zero. So uh, we definitely need a solution, and IPv6 come to rescue. Well, how does IPv6 deploy it globally right now? Here is a graph that APNIC created um, showing the global deployment of IPv6. And you can see that the greener uh, the region is means there are more IPv6 deployment, while the red color indicates there are hardly any. Analyzing this graph and along with some statistics online, we can see that the IPv6 deployment in supporting countries ranging from 0% up to more than 56% in Belgium, and also from a supporting uh, internet service provider, as, uh, as an example, taking North America, it ranges from tw over 21% of AT&T's network to uh, over 77% in Verizon. And taking a look on internet traffic-wise, Google has done statistics showing that more than 16% traffic coming into internet are IPv6 natively. And there's research paper showing that for the future growth of IPv6, by 2019, your IPv6 allocation will be around one-fourth or half of IPv4 allocations. And your IPv6 to IPv4 traffic ratio is around 0.03 to 5. So although slowly, IPv6 is definitely coming. Are we ready for it? Um, let's go some deep dive into the Uber's IPv6 deployment. Here is actually a picture of Uber's physical data center in uh, California. There are, you can see a number of server racks, and this is only one part of that. We definitely have a lot more than that. Um, talking about Uber's network architecture, there are uh, major three blocks of that. First is hardware. Um, we have uniform and consistent hardware. It's modular and scalable, meaning that each of our device row is um, deployed by the same type of hardware. And our network devices supports the uplink of 25 gig, 50 gig, 100 gig to the servers. 
Another important component is automation. You can never manage a, uh, such a big network manually. We have a couple of automated tools that help us to build our data center um, via zero touch provisioning. And we also have these uh, kind of automation tools to help us manage the network daily, as well as monitoring tools to capture issues. And also we started to looking into getting some simple remediations out of these automation tools. Lastly, and most importantly, our network design. We use a class design with routing protocol BGP following IETF RFC 7938. Um, one thing to call out is that this design is in line with a couple of industry companies like uh, Facebook, Microsoft, and LinkedIn. Our network design has bisectional uh, bandwidth. Its uh, convergence time is fast with limited failure domain, and it has vendor interoperability. So taking a look on a high level, um, this is our high level network architecture. Um, so for Uber network, we have a couple of server racks that's grouped together into a pod, and several pods will be grouped together into a cluster. And usually in an Uber data center, um, it's consisted of uh, multiple clusters, and with each clusters connected back to our edge and backbone network before reaching out to internet. And while our network evolved, we started to noticing that most of our bandwidth consumers within the Uber network are internal traffic and uh, specifically east-west traffic. Um, These are due to the number of technologies that we started to use like Hadoop. So we started to enhance our uh, network design within a cluster and we'll build our next generation um, network on top of that. Um, we build a one-to-one -one, uh, unblocking over subscription network. And this, I, we call it IP fabric network. And this network is very similar to the recent um, Facebook and LinkedIn published uh, uh, network architecture. Um, we introduced a fabric plane concept with each of these fabric, uh, color means different fabric plane. It maintains redundancy as well as uh, keep the sh high volume of shared bandwidth at each uh, layer. And the one-on-one -on -one unblocking over subscription rate means that if you have a server um, that has a 25 gig uplink bandwidth, um, when it's talking to any of the hosts within the same IP fabric network, it can maintain 25 gig end to end. Okay, so here is our network architecture. How do we deploy IPv6 on top of it? From an addressing perspective, we have a couple of blocks that we got from regional internet registries. Uh, these are global unique addresses. And we keep one slash 38, uh, which is the uh, IPv6 uh, subnet prefix, that we use that block for external, meaning that it will be routable and on the public internet. And we keep two slash 32 for internal use only. And our IPv6 assignment is modular. Uh, with each rack being assigned a slash 64, and a cluster will get a subnet of n with n smaller than 64. All of our IP allocation and management on the network are going to be automated by tools, and we'll also use this chance to re-addressing the services as they need. So based on our data center network architecture we just talked about, with CLOS and BGP and a repeatable cluster fabric design, it's easy for us to just deploy IPv6 on top of the v4 uh, network that we already have and let them run do a stack. And also on the backbone network, these are the uh, pro routing protocols that we use. Um, we have multi-protocol BGP, ISIS, uh, MPLS, RSVP traffic engineering, etc. And all of these uh, protocols supports IPv6 natively, and we can just deploy IPv6 configurations without tearing down current net a network and let them run do a stack. So those are the changes on the network side that needs to be done. Um, software and automation tools is another important piece that we should uh, focus on as well. Um, be reminded that IPv6 and IPv4 addresses have different text format, and um, one is separated by period and one is separated by columns, and they have different lenses. So a couple of our automation tools and scripts that use regex to match the IPv4 addresses needs to be carefully updated. 
And also on a service perspective, um, the code needs to be updated as well. For example, on over uh, one, one of the HRA proxy that we use, which is a software load balancing, um, the, for different server pools that we use, um, their config files currently have hard-coded IPv4 addresses, and that need, needs to be updated as well. Another place we need to look at is like database. Uh, if your database have some fields that are recording the IP addresses, you, its length needs to be looked at it to make sure that it also supports v, v6 lengths. So from a vendor perspective, um, who's on board supporting IPv6? Luckily, a majority of the hardware vendors, which are the major ones that Uber use, uh, supports major IPv6 features. Our cloud presences are starting to announce full IPv6 support, with some of them working in progress to support all of them. And our major internet service providers that Uber uses supports IPv6 as well. So how is Uber rolling out IPv6? We started with some design documentations. We started writing RFCs for IPv6 addressing and deployment plans. And then we set up labs to test them. Um, we have in-house lab in one of our offices where we set up a, a network simulating our data center network with the IPv6 deployment. And we also partnered with Juniper um, in their JSD lab to simulate IPv6 deployment in our backbone network. And then we're making plans to deploy out this um, to production slowly. And once IPv6 is deployed, what are some benefit, benefited use cases that, um, that we can see out of this? First is front end, we'll be able to serve IPv6 traffic natively. And then we'll be have a scalable solution, um, a, another viable solution when we are dealing with uh, overlapping addresses, or merging with different organizations. And another interesting topic is car offloading. Right now, um, when uh, at a docking station, which is when each of our autonomous cars that parks to offload data, uh, they are currently resolved to the same IPv4 addresses. This is a very smart design uh, in order to preserve IPv4 addresses and also keep the configurations consistent for our engineers. However, imagine with the number of uh, autonomous vehicles we'll be launching and the number of uh, docking stations we'll be building, IPv6 can provide a more scalable solution to that. So what are some of the challenges and lessons learned that we got from this process? For Uber, this uh, definitely is a long planning process. For us, it's still work in progress. And our advice to everyone is that act now while you're still motivated. And the IPv6 deployment is never a zero or all implementation. It requires testing incrementally and iterate. And we also want to advocate engineers awareness when they're writing code to make sure that they are able to support IPv6. So what are some of the things that everyone here, like you, can help us? We hope you can start planning uh, when you are designing software firmware, making sure that IPv6 is capable for your design. And also, if you're a software engineer, um, please help to write IPv6 supportive code. And lastly, please help to advocate IPv6 deployment in the whole internet community and help us to gather more statistics and feedbacks. Thank you. <laughs>